Hello to all our working preachers out there. This is Joy J. Moore. Our spring campaign is off to an amazing start. I am grateful for all the people who have stepped up to support this work. Your support provides a new narrative lectionary podcast each week for preachers across the globe. Your gifts make an immediate impact for millions of people at a time when it is so desperately needed. We need your support during this campaign to ensure these resources continue to be available for free for our users. A gift of $150 will provide one new narrative lectionary podcast. Any gift to the spring campaign will grant you access to additional content from the Sermon Brainwave team at Festival of Homiletics. Go to workingpreacher.org before May 31st to double your impact and have your gift matched dollar for dollar. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. That's right, Sermon Brainwave listeners, we are coming to you with a live recording of Sermon Brainwave here at the Festival of Homiletics. So we have a a live audience in front of us. We're super excited about that. We're here in Denver for the 30th anniversary of the Festival of Homiletics, and we're doing a live, live recording of the text for Pentecost Sunday which falls on June 5, 2022, and here are the texts. The first reading is from Acts chapter 2, 1 through 21. The alternate first reading is Genesis 11, 1 through 9. The psalm is Psalm 104, 24 through 34, and 35b, 35b. Everybody got that? Okay. Second reading is Romans 8, 14 through 17, and the gospel is from John, chapter 14, 8 through 17, and then you have those little brackets with, for 25 through 27, and you totally have to use those. <laughs> always, add, <laughs> always. always add verses. Yeah. So Pentecost Sunday, I mean, one of the things that we always talk about when we have these festival Sundays is is navigating the not not necessarily the balance but navigating how much do you talk about the festival and how much do you talk about the text and uh, and how does a sermon not turn into you know an, a treatise on pneumatology which nobody really wants to listen to at least i know i don't and so how is it that we can look at each of these texts and, and pay a pen, attention to the particularity of, of that text pneumatology. And I've often said this, I've said this from the very beginning, but on, and, and for a while I got in trouble for it, but I'm not anymore, I think people are used to it, is that on Pentecost Sunday you have to pick your spirit. Right? You have to pick your spirit. Not that there's like many spirits, that's what I got in trouble for. Uh, I'm not saying that, but, but we have such a rich wonderful, amazing breadth of pneumatology in scripture, of the role, the presence, the function of the Holy Spirit in in our lives. And so that's something that we always are kind of navigating is how do we how do we pay attention to those particularities and really let the text speak that specificity of what it's saying about the spirit. So with that, John. Yeah. <laughs> start with John. Let's start with John. Who has a very unique pneumatology. And we should also note that John is always the gospel lesson for Pentecost, just different sections of John. So in year A, it's always John 20, 19 through 23. Uh, year B is selections from chapter 15 and 16. So the other two locations of the paraclete, the advocate in the farewell discourse. But what we have in year C is the very first reference to the paraclete, otherwise known as the advocate, but can be translated all different ways. So this is the first reference then to the paraclete in the Gospel of John, and this is where in this section, in the farewell discourse, is where John 
is developing, uh, it really is pre presenting the pneumatology of, of, of how the spirit works and who the spirit is, so. Yeah, I think even more widely, it's, it's important to think about how John sets this with Jesus speaking to people who are agitated. Yeah. People who are either worried or frightened or haven't gotten the message quite right. So it's not uh, the spirit will come and will assist you in advancing the mission or taking over the world or things like that. He's speaking to people who need to hear this word of peace and are worried. Uh, well, I don't know if they're worried about being isolated from him or abandoned by him, but that's part of the things he's talking about, right? That it, I'm going to go away, but better things are coming, mm -hmm. which I'm sure nobody believes when he says that, right? How could it be better than this? I think that point is really important that, and as we think about the role of the spirit in our lives, uh, and particularly in the context of this, of this, this, con this conference, right, uh, of the festival, is that you have this, uh, this attention to the Holy Spirit here in the farewell discourse, in the midst of troubled hearts in the midst of the disciples true storm <laughs> when because we're in chapter 14 but what's already happened in chapter 13 is the betrayal of Judas and the foreshadowing of of Peter's denial and then Jesus before in the beginning of chapter 14 says then do not let your hearts be troubled and uh and says I'm going away and then Thomas says we don't know the way and Jesus says yes you know the way I'm the way and so it's into that, in that troubled hearts and, and, and that sense of betrayal and denial and who's next and Jesus says he's going away into which the spirit enters. So I think that's one homiletical move for this, spirit, this Pentecost Sunday is uh, that's where the spirit comes. In that moment. is into the exact moment that you're wondering and that your hearts are deeply, deeply troubled. And I was, I was struck with um, uh, verse 8 as uh, it, uh, Philip opens up and says, um, uh, show us the Father, and he simply says, and we will be satisfied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th th it, there's that same level of, you know, Peter's, I'll never deny you. And, you know, there's this sense, you just tell us this and we'll be good. And Jesus is actually offering more because the reality is we're not satisfied. Even with the things we ask of God, we're not satisfied. It's like, Lord, give me this. In your name, I get this, right? Oh, now that I've got that. Maybe I want a little bit more. And so it is in the midst of that, this is all I need, that Jesus says, no, I'm going to show you what you really need. And this is truly going to be what satisfies you. You don't know it yet, but the spirit is what you need as a comfort in that peace, as a teacher, and as an advocate. That would be a way I would go. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like them. It's yeah. <laughs> we should do this live all the time. We should do this live all the time. Oh. Exactly. The, oh, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say the extravagance of that, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, really, this is all I need and I'm satisfied. <laughs> Which, I mean, Jesus is, knows that he's either you know, lying or doesn't really realize what he's talking about, but just the extravagance, just the so much more, right? That's such a part of John's gospel. Yeah, sure. uh, I, I recently finished a, a five week series on John at my church um, and what finally helped them get it was the meme that some people might have seen. It's the, the guy who played Elton John in Rocket Man sitting in the driver, the passenger seat of a car wearing all these feathers and stuff. And the guy driving, his friend is just looking at him like, and the meme is it says the guy who's driving, the, the, the normal looking guy, right? The guy who looks like me. Looks is, like you. Yeah, is, <laughs> yeah, it says Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John is the, the, <laughs> the totally flamboyant, just like, John you know, filling the entire car, right? I said, this is, this is John. That, you know, all the stuff that could have been said in a sentence or two, John's like, I'm going to give you 10, and I'm going to say things like even greater works than these, right? It's just, it's just over and above, right? The volume's just turned up so much, which some people don't like if you've been taught to read the Bible in a certain way, but... This is what pulls not only the artists out, 
about the dreamers out in a congregation. And once you give them permission to do that, it's been fun in this Bible study for me to just kind of say, let your imagination go with this and then ask, what if this is true and what would that look like? Wow. Yeah, and, the, and to, uh, to develop that even further, like in verse 12, right? Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. And, I, and then you're kind of, you've got to like do sort of a flashback and say, okay, let's see, greater works, water into wine, you know, <laughs> man born blind, Lazarus from the dead. And what are these greater works that I'm gonna be able to do? And of course those works are connected to uh, that, that outpouring of love that God has for the world. And so to do greater works is, is going to be for the disciples, that invitation to come and see. Uh, in John, of course, the only time that the, the, the first time that the disciples are actually sent is after they have received the Holy Spirit. And so this is really, this is a, this is a, a recalling, of course, of, the, of John 3.16, but a looking forward to what, how is John 3.16 going to come true <laughs> without the disciples uh, going in and, and loving the world? And so those works are, the works are specifically defined by, uh, by love. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you get in verse you know, 15, that, that those works are going to be defined by that love, which Jesus has already mentioned in, back in chapter 13, 31 to 35, yeah. for the sake of God's love. Right? God loves the world. So. And that God would be glorified. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there as a teaser because I'm going to circle back around that in another, in another nice. set of scriptures. Okay. Okay. Nice. Going to have a recall. I'm going to have a recall. All right. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Uh, maybe a couple more things. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I got How many fingers thing. did you hold up there? You've like got witnesses. Couple. All right. Yeah, something like that. Uh, well, the first is if you decide to go with John and just, build, just building that whole pneumatology of the paraclete. Uh, the one who is called alongside you and that the way in which that and if you fast forward and read chapter 15 and read chapter 16 uh, there are so many possibilities for the translation of the paraclete depending on what the paraclete is doing so fundamentally the paraclete the spirit is one who accompanies you mm -hmm. one who is called to be alongside you as a guide as a teacher as an aid as a helper as a comforter intercessor, advocate, and so really, and maybe you invite people into their own definition. If they think, if they imagine the, spirit, the paraclete or the spirit as the one who accompanies them, how might they, what, what word, what noun would they use uh, in that regard? And pairing that up with ask anything, so what then would you ask for? Yeah. If, yeah. if what spirit do you need and then that's what you ask for. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is just to note in verse 17 that uh, this spirit of truth, you know him because he abides with you, <laughs> right? And you all know that's a big John word, but that is what that signals though is that abiding of abiding in Jesus and Jesus abides you know, in us and the Father and abiding, everybody's abiding. Uh, but that repetition is really pointing to uh, this intimacy of the Spirit, that the Spirit will not only be alongside us, but of course in chapter 20, in, breathed into us, right? Emphusao. So here's my worry about this with John is... What? Well, it, <laughs> the Pentecost scene in Acts is... Not only is it more obviously communal, it's also the way the spirit is manifested is through other people. It's through speech, it's through interaction, it's through this bigger event. So much of what we read here in John, I think is taken by a lot of people as the spirit is my own private possession, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So how does the spirit accompany, how does the spirit provide peace? Obviously some of that is individual, some of that is deeply personal and introspective, but some of it comes through hearing the spirit speak through others, yeah. right? And that's just, this is where I think the John passage needs a little more, one more feather in the boa for Elton John is, um, right, just one more thing, way of saying sometimes the way we encounter the spirit is not necessarily through something supernatural or even introspective. Right. 
sometimes it's through the basic work that we do, through visitation work, through service work, through the words of others, yeah. the corrections of others, the ideas of others. Well, and I think that maybe the key to that too is, uh, is to note that when Jesus introduces the advocate, he says, I will give you another advocate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jesus has already Served. walked alongside <laughs> and told them things and shared things with them. And so it, it invites, in some ways, I mean, he doesn't quite say this, but I think Jesus should have said it, <laughs> uh, is that how will you be paracletes to one another? Right? right? How, how will you walk alongside each other? That's part of, part of imagining the spirit walking alongside is then you walk alongside each other. And I think that rehearsal that you did earlier of, of what are the things, what are the works that Jesus has already done, mm -hmm. those works, especially in the list that you gave, are works that are not individual. So yeah. they are where Jesus has shown us what it means to show up and to be there to uh, offer peace, to uh, enter in, to help, to heal, to... And I think using that kind of scriptural reminder to set that up as the scriptural imagination might be one way to uh, make sure we don't fall into that individualism. Because mm -hmm. I think you're right, we, we too easily want to say, me and Jesus. And this whole thing is about God loving the world. Mm -hmm. And if it's all about that, then it can't be just me. So. Well, we better move on or we're going to spend the entire time on John and, oh, okay. and the crowd will get upset. So, <laughs> I don't know why. Well, you know, one of the, <laughs> I think one of the challenges. I understand that. Yeah, one of the challenges of Pentecost in general is to help people celebrate it, embrace it, live into it, not as a past event, not as a kind of uh, nostalgia, like it would have been really cool to have been there, or this is the birthday of the church, that kind of language kind of falls flat on me. I rather would see people be invited to see Pentecost as a, as a recurring event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously the first Pentecost is what it is, especially in the book of Acts and as a foundational moment, but to help people imagine where other times and places, whether in Acts, whether in the New Testament as a whole or in the history of this congregation, where we have sensed the spirit calling us to step into a new horizon or to open, see a new horizon open up in front of us and, and to see Pentecost as something that builds expectation as opposed to a past event that needs to be explained. Mm -hmm. um, I think the John text can do that. Mm -hmm. I know the Romans text can. I really know that the Acts 2 text, you need to kind of talk about what does this set in motion as opposed to what does this accomplish? Right, right, right. Especially when we're going into the season of Pentecost. Right, right. right. So how can you help people move into that reality of the yep. presence of the Spirit and the working of yep. the Spirit? And I think, I think poignantly in this moment in, um, in coming back in worshiping together with the pandemic, I mean, what are those new things and new possibilities that we're trusting the spirit to guide us in? Mm -hmm. yeah. And a reminder in terms of that this was a normal, uh, uh, regular gathering, that yeah. Pentecost was already a holiday, right. mm -hmm. and therefore- in Still is. In, and <laughs> still Jewish is, holiday, yeah. a Jewish holiday. And it, it was already a holiday, it was already a time for gathering, and it is in that gathering that to use the, uh, what you reminded us of uh, from John is where we see uh, a greater work of Jesus, a, 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 a mm -hmm. unexpected abundant showing up of the Spirit of God yeah. in the place where the people of God were already used to gathering. Yeah. So that's one way to, to... Yeah, and Nadia mentioned that Yeah. this morning. Sometimes. All days are blurring together. Yeah. It was uh, this but I think it was this morning, this right? Where she, <laughs> she, her church gathered for the first time on Pentecost. And, you know, and it's so easy to pass over that first verse. Mm -hmm. When the day of Pentecost had come and they were all together in one place. And and it sounds what, terrifying now. <laughs> well, but 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 yeah. I mean, how how much how uh, how that rings just so beautifully yeah. right. to imagine that that the promise of the Spirit in that in that gathering space of the faithful mm -hmm. that the gathered that the faithful are gathered. You know, one thing that was really interesting that I don't know. I've really thought about, and I'm. I uh, am still thinking about it, is, is also the timing that yet here, of course, the gift of the Spirit is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and, but in John, it's on the same day as the empty tomb. 
And I, I wonder about that with help of, of thinking about the spirit and uh, and the way in which uh, and the way in which is there some sort of sense of of delay of the spirit that people get anxious about? Mm -hmm. When is the spirit going to come? Mm -hmm. um, and yet and yet there's a promise here that yeah it it it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I just thought that was really really curious. Okay, uh, can yeah. I can I? Yeah. Hold on to that, but Matt, you put something in my imagination, um, and it, it, it was where you said um, coming back together and all in one place is terrifying. It has been in the okay. last two years. It, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But This is the closest it, we've been in I, I know, this is the first time we've been together <laughs> like this. Um, but it, it, you have in my imagination this idea of how do we get away from it being only me, and if we linger in that idea that you just brought up, that it reminds us that it's terrifying to think that I've got to talk about my experience of the spirit, not as my individual experience, but how is it communal? And we could use that language that you just used to say this is terrifying, to say, yeah, it's different. It's going to be scary. scary. It's what I called awesome, which means awful. <laughs> I'll fill, I'll fall. J just playing with that. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, that, that's what made me think about that. And the, did I cut you off? Are you yeah. doing a good sound? Uh, the, um, the, um, the connection to place, I think, matters for thinking about difference and, and people and, and ethnicity and how this is also an ethnic story with the table of nations here. And um, people in this audience probably, I'm guessing, have not read the commentaries on the website yet. <laughs> because you haven't gotten that far perhaps in your Pentecost preparations. But there's an interesting debate going on in the commentaries on the website yeah, where, where the author of the commentary on Acts 2 describes this as a, as a reversal or a redemption of Babel in Genesis 11, which is also one of the optional texts this week. And then the author of the Genesis 11 passage says, some people say that Pentecost is a reversal of Babylon, but it's not. So that's um, we usually try not to evaluate the commentaries when we're live on Sermon Brainwave or even not live on Sermon <laughs> Brainwave, but you have to make a decision there if you're going to put those into, a, into conversation. And, and one of the arguments about this that I personally find more persuasive is that, uh, that it's not, that, that Babel is not regarded as a kind of curse, mm -hmm. that monoculture is not God's design yeah. or uh, something that, that that God doesn't like scatter and then try to recreate a monoculture right. to bless the church. Right. Right. But rather, I think Pentecost from its core is a resistance to monoculture. It's a resistance to the ways in which part of the Roman Empire's message was this cultural homogeneity, was part of its way of, dis of displaying its military might, especially its economic might, was this is, an, this is an empire where if you get on board and you do what you're told and you know your place, right, and you serve the system, you'll be safe and you'll get on board and you'll do, I mean, look at how the, the author of, of the book of Revelation, what the author of Revelation thinks about that, right? That's a strong pushback, but, but that's an important message, especially for our day. I'm sure our perspective on that text is, is shaped by our own uh, struggles to live into a truly multi-ethnic expression of the, king, of the reign of God in our, in our congregations, but. Yeah, and I think not only the, the reality of the empire and uh, and that that imperial presence, uh, and and moving everybody to that kind of homogeneity, but it also it causes us to reflect on just the general human drive toward homogeneity. Oh yeah, and it's a lot then, easier to right? live that way sometimes. It, yeah, it? and that yeah. actually the divine plan is diversity, mm -hmm. and so that I think that's a, could be a main theme. Um, one one thing that too I. I thought about uh, this year is verse four, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe this is where you recognize not only all present, but where you take people back to the presence and the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit from the beginning of the book of Luke. And so that this is the second volume and you've got, uh, you know, that John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. Zechariah, right, Simeon. And so that all <laughs> is, is all-encompassing mm -hmm. and, and the way in which uh, nothing really happens in Jesus' ministry without 
that presence of the spirit. And so uh, I think that that all creates also a kind of of continuity mm -hmm. uh, and and pushes so uh, past the text, which is really what the spirit does, right? Pushes past the way in which we try to confine. Uh, the Spirit of God. I'm going to play a little bit about with uh, what, you, what you were talking about, Matt, in terms of uh, which way to go with uh, whether this is a reversal or not. And as I was reading and, and probably reflecting on that, I was caught by the fact that what it says is divided tongues. Mm. So that what is actually happening here is while the message was understood uni in, in, in unified, um, what, what, what would I say? Um, bringing glory to God. They talked about the things that God had done. I wonder where I got that from. Anyway, um, but um, that there were all of these different languages. So when I read this this time, what I noted was divided tongues among them, which go to different languages, the languages of all the people, all the nations, all the different um, 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 forms of communication there. And what it says, parenthetically, is as a fire. And so many, so many times, maybe because I'm a United Methodist, we spend a lot of time talking about the flames uh, that were landing on everyone's head. But it, it's more of a simile r rather than it is an, uh, a, a literal. And so I began to look at this to say, hmm, how does a fire spread, especially now when we have all of these bad weather events, and um, how would that idea fit with loudness of language? And all I could think of was either being in a train station and having all of these people chattering around you, or being with a bunch of children, um, having a, bunch, a lot of chatter going around. And what does that do? Is it gets loud, it gets confusing, it gets where you don't know what's going, but what's happening in this moment of loudness, what's happening in this moment of chatter, what's happening in this moment of disruption is folks are understanding the acts of God. So God is glorified. Mm -hmm. Okay, I preached again. <laughs> well, and they're attracted to it, right? It's, yes. it's drawn people in. It draws people in, yeah. And they want to hear it. And then there's also, the, but the key question then is, what does this mean? Yeah. Right, that's what launches Peter's Pentecost sermon. Exactly. What does this mean? Okay, we get, the, we're hearing stuff. This mm -hmm. is strange. And we're, we're hearing the, the this idea of the deeds of God, but what does this mean? Like, why here? Why now? Why this place? Mm -hmm. Which is where Peter now says this is a, a Christian thing, right? This is connected to Christ, Christ. Uh, crucified, raised, and ascended. So it's, there's still that work, right? You still need a preacher to walk in and, and yes. answer the what does this mean question. Mm -hmm. Which takes me to my next point. Do it. I just don't Yeah, hear, and um, then we still have that so inclusio to sew up. We st I do. I'm still I holding do. on to that in um, my head. Uh, amazed and astonished. What amazes and astonishes people about the witness of the church today? It's not good. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, we're guilty of being hypocritical. We're guilty of being judgmental. We're guilty of being arrogant. We're built, guilty of being closed. It's interesting and in this text, what they are accused of, they're not guilty of. They're drunk. Oh, I see. No, you're not. They're not drunk. This is something really. We should not be hypocrites. We should not be judgmental. We should not be these things that seem to be what people are amazed and astonished about. What then should we be doing that would make people amazed and astonished that would bring glory to God. And that becomes the work of the preacher to say, when Christ shows up, when the spirit of God falls upon us, it's good, it's inclusive, it's every tongue, it's every tribe, it's all filled. Mm -hmm. That becomes good news. Well, one of the things that will bring Rolf back is if we um, say a lot of really dumb things about the Old Testament texts and the which, Psalm. Which I'm real guilt, willing to be guilty of. Are you of willing to right do now? that? Can I just yeah. say one thing? Like, you don't have to read the, the Babel text in Genesis 11 if you want to skip it and avoid that uncomfortable 
A except for yeah, I want to I want to take a position. But if you've got something to say about it, I want to hear it. I want to take a position. Somewhere Rolf is leaning closer. <laughs> leaning in and listening yeah. right now, going, "What is she going to mess this up with?" Um, but uh, that this one tongue idea. Um, is that it brought folks together, and this is really where the question of glorifying God comes up for me. Mm -hmm. It brought folks together in a unified language, but to do things to make a name for ourselves, not to bring glory to God. So it's not a curse. God isn't cursing. God is saying, if humanity keeps going down this way, it's going to get worse. We've got to put a stop to it. And if we pay attention to this promise of God being good news, it explains why the promise in Genesis 12 is for all nations to be blessed. So the first time God loves the world is not when Jesus is born and in, you know, it says in, in, to, to, to Nicodemus, God so loves the world. It's way back here where God's love for the world says, this way of going is going to bring disaster. And so I'm going to intervene. I'm going to start dividing tongues. And I'm going to preserve my story with these people for the sake of all the world. And that becomes the prologue to the rest of the story that begins in Genesis 12 and, and is the people of Israel. So um, that, that, that's one way of looking at yep. Yeah, Genesis. that works. <laughs> Yep. Totally work. And again, well, if you want to get into the question of hegemony, right, or sameness and the problem of that and, and what that does to people who don't fit and what kind of arrogance that can breed vis-a-vis -vis God, yeah, all that stuff is I'm really taken to in, in this story about the, uh, with the images of the, the contrast between cities and towers no, yeah, yeah, yeah. and scatteredness. And, uh, and how that, how is it that that, how, how is it that a city and a tower represents that capacity or that human desire for that location and that, uh, and, and that kind of um, mm, representation of, of power mm -hmm. or representation of, of that kind of control. And yet scatteredness has a sense of uncontrol <laughs> and uh, and so that might be a direction to go to in terms of of how the test how the text speaks the truth about our human propensity toward that and so that mm -hmm. image I, those images really work for me too do we want to talk about Psalm 104 I have Where's an answer I have an idea <laughs> what's your idea oh dear why don't we just I have, well, we have everybody. Let's have, let's have the audience say it in unison. Uh, everybody we? say liturgically. <laughs> yes, yes. Although. That wasn't uh, even set up. That wasn't even rehearsed. No, it wasn't. No, we didn't even rehearse that. Uh, well, it was yeah. 14 years of doing Sermon Brainwave, and you've got them right where you I, want uh, them. Uh, liturgically. But, uh, but I have actually a specific idea okay. about liturgy. <laughs> Not just generally use it liturgically. Because you've got a lot going on uh, with, with Pentecost anyway. But is there a way in the worship service that you could use this, uh, use this as a refrain? I am, and particularly, I'm looking at verse 29 and 30. So to paraphrase that a little bit and do something along the lines of, when you take away, uh, when you take away your breath, mm. we die. Uh, but when you send forth your spirit, we are created or we are recreated. And I'm wondering if that could be a refrain throughout the service, mm -hmm. uh, as a as an opening, a call to worship, or and just bringing that throughout the entire service as a recognition of of another way to think about Pentecost, right, is God's very in-breathing of God's breath. Uh, and uh, which, of course, you get in the, in the John text, but that's, that's huge for the Old Testament, yeah. right, is that the very breath of God is what brings the dust guy to life. Yes. <laughs> uh, the very breath of God is what brings the dry bones back to back life. To yeah. And in Ezekiel 37, it's the same verb. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, and so and and what would it sound like for the congregation to say, "You take your breath away and we die." 
you, you send forth your breath and we live again. Yeah. I think that could be powerful. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. That's much better than what I got caught up on on that one. I'll just say that um, I did appreciate that there was so much God that is described in this psalm, but I just got stuck at the fact that as we were naming everything, and it was naming all the creatures and all, it named the creepy things again. It's like, why, God? <laughs> so I really like your liturgical frame. Yes, the creepy things, they're always there. <sighs> creepy spider, creepy things. I'll just say the spirit of God is good for life. I mean, that's part of what the whole psalm's about, right? This <laughs> idea of God as a, as a creative and sustaining force. So yeah, yeah. I won't talk about any critters, though. <laughs> we did that in a recent... Podcast, yes, I think is yet to be aired. <laughs> All right, Romans chapter. Oh, goodness, so much uh, to say. <laughs> Another really different take on the spirit, though, right? The spirit is this pledge of adoption. The spirit is a marker of your childship, <laughs> of, of, of one of God's um, children, and not only that, but a joint heir with Christ. Yeah, and the I, commentary. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, oh, sorry, really quick. The commentary just talks about all these, these compound verbs of with, that all these things happen with. with. We do this with God, with, 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 we belong with God. Now, that's just what I was going to oh, point so out. Oh, so sorry. That the, I no, stole no, it from no, the no. commentary. No, no, that the commentary uh, really helps us to see mm -hmm. the levels of intimacy here. Mm -hmm. uh, and another way to think about the spirit is that, is bringing us into this intimacy with God and with Jesus. And, and, and how does that, and what does that mean? And so you've got the verbs as children of God, right? But also Abba, Father, that's the other mm -hmm. intimate thing. But in uh, verse 16, that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit. So that's one, one of the with verbs. Uh, the other one is joint, uh, is we suffer with, mm -hmm. with, uh, with Jesus and that also glorify with. So those are all these soon or soon verbs and then uh and then also it the heirs of god and then joint heirs is also uh soon heirs <laughs> so it's another soon verb soon is s you know as y'all following me s-u-n with okay good but yeah i mean it, so this piling on of these soon soon verbs uh is a way rhetorically right to emphasize that intimacy and I'm just uh, going to um, focus uh, on um, verse 15 where it says you don't receive a spirit of slavery uh, to fall back into uh, to, to fear. And I'm just going to lift this up because to not be enslaved means that we are not, it, we, what is removed is the demand. And I would like to um, uh, replace the idea that so much is that this is what you have to do. If you are filled with the Spirit, it looks like this, and it's going to be this way, and you're going to do these things. Mm -hmm. And ask, again, using the words from, uh, uh, from um, uh, uh, what was it, Acts, um, what is compelling us that would amaze and astonish? So rather than demand and require to be so filled that folks are astonished and amazed that they are compelled to receive with God what will glorify God. Yeah, and, and, all, and when you think about that, like the verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit, that's a present yeah. passive participle. Like, so it, again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about Pentecost is not just this one day, right. but it's, it's, it reminds you of of phrases in like Galatians where Jesus, where G Jesus, Paul, same difference. But when Paul says, uh, when Paul, Paul doesn't say if you are in the spirit, no, since, since. you are in the spirit. And that, that, that spirit leads yes. and what kind of awesomeness, yes. right? Will the spirit lead the church into professing and testifying? Mm -hmm. 